Today at the National Press Club, investor and philanthropist Simon Holmes Accord. After working to transform Australia's energy sector, Mr Holmes Accord wants to transform the parliament. He's the founder of the Climate 200 Group, backing independent candidates at the coming election. Simon Holmes Accord with today's Press Club Address. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the National Press Club this afternoon for our Westpac address. My name is David Crow. I'm a director of the Press Club, also the chief political correspondent at The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. And a welcome to our guest today, Simon Holmes of Court, who's been making waves in Australian politics as the founder of Climate 200, the group that is fielding or supporting candidates at the coming election on an independent platform on climate change and integrity and other issues. Simon's background is that he has uh, been involved or active with Climate 200 for a couple of years now, including at the last election. Uh, but uh, before that, of course, he um, he's a descendant of the famous Holmes Accord family uh, and began life, I think, as a, um, a computer programmer in Silicon Valley after his studies. And then after that point, uh, worked in, I think it was a, his own startup company, active in um, agriculture, uh, and then turned his sights on uh, renewable energy and eventually set up Climate 200. Um, he, uh, 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 in a recent profile, revealed that he had told his wife Katrina and their four children that he would put, be putting $200,000 of his own money into Climate 200. So I guess that's politics where you put your money where your mouth is. Uh, please welcome Simon Home to the Court for his address today. Thanks a lot, David, for that kind introduction. I start by acknowledging that today we meet on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I, expend, I extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. The resilience and wisdom of your culture is perhaps our nation's greatest treasure. <clears throat> Let me also welcome former independent member for Indi, Cathy McGowan, the pathfinder and inspiration. <laughs> pathfinder and inspiration to the community independence movement. And the former independent senator for South Australia, Tim Storer. <laughs> I, I also acknowledge Meg Lees, the former leader of the Democrats and a member of Climate 200's advisory council. <laughs> it's a great honour to stand here today an opportunity like no other, and it's a challenge. Speaking of which, a little bit later, I'm going to detail a challenge for the major parties on campaign funding, a challenge they can fix with the snap of their fingers as we approach this upcoming election. Australian politics is broken. That's the problem. That's why we're here today. Australians are generally a positive people, yet engaged Australians are deeply frustrated that we're not making progress on the issues that matter. We are frustrated that so often our government is found to be either lying or incompetent, and sometimes both. We have a government more interested in winning elections than improving our great nation. We have a government that seeks power without purpose. But first, let me give you three examples that are greatly frustrating engaged Australians. We are frustrated about climate inaction, we are frustrated about corruption in politics, and we are frustrated about the treatment and safety of women. Let's start with climate change. In February 2019, just three months before the last federal election, the coalition's lack of climate policy was an embarrassment. Desperate not to go into the election empty-handed, the coalition announced a $3.4 billion climate solutions package. 
3.4 billion dollars sounds like a lot of money, right? Well, 1.4 billion of that had already been allocated to Snowy 2.0, announced two years earlier. And the remaining $2 billion was essentially Tony Abbott's Emissions Reduction Fund, rebranded as the Climate Solutions Fund. Initially, the government said it would invest that $2 billion over 10 years, $200 million a year in emissions reduction. But when the budget was announced, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg stretched that decade to 15 years, with only $189 million allocated over four years. So in essence, more than three quarters of that annual spend evaporated in an instant. And weeks later, in the heat of the election campaign, the Treasurer announced $260 million for a level crossing removal project in his own electorate. Yet a, a piece of pork barrelling received more funding than the, than the government's signature climate policy. Right. But it gets worse. Here we are three years on and not one cent of the Climate Solutions Fund has been spent. Not one cent. Yet right now, our government is spending millions, something like $7 million a month at the moment, on the positive energy greenwashing campaign. Telling us that Australia is doing great on emissions reduction. A bald-faced lie. This is taxpayer-funded election advertising, disguised as information. The truth? By the government's own numbers, real emissions have fallen by less than 1% between 2013 and 2020. And outside of the electricity sector, under the government's plans, emissions are flatlining, not falling, through to the end of this decade. The government's plan to reduce emissions is a joke that nobody finds funny. And nor should they, because it is consistent with the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef and the 64,000 full-time jobs that it supports, which is more than are employed in the coal mining sector. It's also consistent with increased intensity and frequency of bushfires, like those we saw in the Black Summer. Now, many conservatives are aghast at this. We're abrogating our responsibility to conserve nature and passing on a massive debt to our children. And what's more, we're missing in action on the biggest economic and business opportunity of this century. Climate action means huge new industries. And this, this transformation definitely is a race. Because we're not the only country that's endowed with abundant, cheap, clean energy and the minerals needed for the 21st century. For example, few realise the role that Australia plays in the electric vehicle revolution. More than half of the critical minerals in every Tesla that zooms around the world's streets comes from Australia. But Australia makes just sense on the dollar on those minerals because our government has ridiculed electric vehicles and they've sent our manufacturers overseas. We've failed to invest in mineral refinery and battery cell production. So most of the economic of, e value of these Australian minerals is being captured overseas by countries with much more long-sided governments. This time last year, BMW struck a deal, hundreds of millions of dollars worth with the United Arab Emirates to buy green aluminium. That aluminium is produced with solar energy and exactly the type of, our op of opportunity that our government should be working to secure for Australia. Deloitte estimates that 250,000 jobs and $680 billion economic boost are ours for the taking if we truly embrace policies that rapidly take us to net zero emissions. It can benefit our economy every bit as much as the gold rushes did back in the 19th century. Now, it's 38 years since Science Minister Barry Jones first raised climate change on the floor of Parliament. And yet, this government's climate policy is to shirk our responsibilities, lie about our progress, and close our eyes to the opportunities ahead. They brandish lumps of coal in Parliament, and Australians have had a gutful. 
People are fed up and can you blame them? Now next, integrity. Where do I start? Watergate, the $80 million sale of water that doesn't exist to a Cayman Islands company established by a man who is now a minister in the government. Grassgate, an attempt to quietly delist an endangered grass species on that same minister's property. We've seen the trashing of freedom of information, uh, of the information system, as independent Rex Patrick has fought so hard to highlight. We've seen the defunding of the Australian National Audit Office, the organisation that uncovered the Leppington Triangle disgrace, sports rorts, car park rorts, and just yesterday, the Safer Community Fund rorts. But most of all, the failure to legislate a national anti-corruption commission is yet another broken promise from a government full of broken promises. So here we are. Women around the country are red hot with anger. They're furious that we have made so little progress over recent decades and that the current leadership team treats women as if they are some political problem to be managed. You have to wonder whether the poor representation of women in parliament isn't, isn't partly to blame for the culture that we find ourselves in. Just 20% of coalition members in the lower house are women. 25 years ago, it was 21%. Ruth McGowan, one of Cathy's nine sisters, runs monthly boot camps for women who have decided to run for parliament. Ruth tells me that since Ms Tame and Ms Higgins and so many others stepped forward last year, demand for her training is off the charts. Professional women are standing up, they're putting their hands up and standing up to be independents. As Monique Ryan, the independent candidate for Kuyong said recently, when a woman in her 50s sees a problem, she says to herself, just give it to me, I'll fix it. One of my favourite contemporary thinkers is Lawrence Lessig of the Harvard Law School. Lessig has dedicated much of the last decade to identifying and trying to fix the structural flaws that threaten our fragile democracies. He introduced me to the well-known Henry David Thoreau quote that there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. There are many ways that we hack at the branches for change in our society. You can write letters to the paper. You can complain on social media. You can join millions signing petitions online or march in the streets. You can meet regularly with your local member, as I did for many years with Josh Frydenberg. And I even joined his personal fundraising group, the Kuyong 200. Some choose to join the parties and attempt change from within. Many donate to charities to advocate on their behalf. But the sad reality is, in many ways, Australia is going backwards. We have a lower renewable energy target in 2022 than we had in 2010. 15 years ago, both major parties went to the election with a plan to make polluters pay. That is unthinkable in 2022. Just last month, Australia recorded its worst ever score in the annual Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. And in 2021, Australia dropped from 24th to 50th place on the World Economic Forum's gender, Global Gender Gap Index. Hacking at the branches hasn't been working. We have to strike at the root. And I say that striking at the root means getting people into parliament who are strong, independent, and ready to hold government accountable. Unfortunately, the game is rigged. Wouldn't it be great to have parliament filled with better people? The reason, is we, the reason we don't is because we're very rarely given any real choice. That's because politics is a game where the winners write the rules. The parties give them access to every voter's personal details. They make themselves exempt from the, from the Privacy Act so they can spam them. 
They exempt themselves from truth in advertising laws. So it's perfectly legal for politicians to lie to you. Every member has access to more than $750,000 per term for what is euphemistically called office and communications budgets. These are often used for campaigning. On top of taxpayer-funded ad campaigns I referenced earlier, the majors receive huge donations from vested interests. Politics has become a multi-billion dollar game. Over the last decade, the major parties have received $1.8 billion in funding, $180 million a year, and much of it from undisclosed sources. In 2019 alone, the coalition received $65 million in undisclosed donations. Josh Frydenberg's Kuyong 200 Club received $2.8 million over the last five years without disclosing a single donor, not one. Clive Palmer spent $89 million in 2019, but as he so clearly showed, money alone won't get you there. You need people power too. I wish it were possible for great candidates like Zoe Daniel, Dr Monique Ryan, Allegra Spender, Kylie Tink, Dr Sophie Scomps, to get elected with ev evidence-based policy and people power alone, as, uh, as democracy should be. But if an ind independent citizen is brave enough to stand up against the party machines, even if they can raise a million dollars, they're very likely to be outspent two to one as Zali Stegall was in 2019. The political parties are Goliaths, and they have rigged the game. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes in David and Goliath battles, David wins. The communities of Indai, Warringah, Mayo and Clark have all set a shining example for others to follow. I wasn't there at the beginning. I don't think anyone can say really when this community independence movement started. Was it when Cathy McGowan brought 300 people from 72 electorates together last year and trained them on how to replicate the success at Indi? Or was it when Helen Haynes and Zali Stegall showed leadership by introducing landmark anti-corruption and net zero bills? How about in 2019, when independents Karen Phelps, Julia Banks and Tim Storer joined other crossbenchers to make refugee medivac legislation a reality? Was it in 2013 when against the odds in the regional Victorian electorate of Indi, Cathy McGowan uh, won against Sophie Mirabella? Was it in 2010 when Tony Windsor, Rob Oakeshott and Andrew Wilkie helped, us, helped get us ARENA, the National Renewable Energy Agency, and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation? Or was it back in 1996 when Ted Mack became the independent uh, member for North Sydney? Maybe we can go all the way back to the first decade of, of Federation and, uh, and look at suffragist Vida Goldstein. Instrumental in winning women the vote for federal parliament in 1902, Vida stood for election five times as an independent because she thought party structures meant that selfish log rollers got into parliament. Unfortunately, Vida lost her five campaigns as an independent, but I'd like to think if she were campaigning today, this community independence movement would have her back. The independent, th this election, voters in over 20 electorates are being offered a new political choice a viable option for breaking the political deadlock on vital issues. These communities have the opportunity of a community-backed independent candidate. These candidates are genuine community leaders, not career politicians. These incumbent, the incumbent independents act as a backbone for our parliament. They introduce legislation that's too hot to handle by the conflicted majors, and they provide a check on government overreach. So often, they are the conscience of Parliament. Consider Andrew Wilkie's focus on gambling reform, an area the major parties are too afraid to go anywhere near. 
Just last week, it was Rebecca Sharkey's amendment to the Sex Discrimination Act that secured five Liberals to cross the floor and protect the rights of marginalised and vulnerable children. While a party MP is answerable to their faction, their party, their donors and their branch before they can get around to attending to constituents, a community-backed independent is answerable just to their community, no more, no less. As Meg Lee said recently, in this decade, it is the independents who will keep the bastards honest. Voters increasingly believe that the major parties no longer represent them and they're leaving the major parties in droves. At the last election, a quarter of Australians did not vote for either major parties. Today, I'd like to share two observations from our latest polling of nearly 9,000 voters across 11 electorates where independents are running. Firstly, Scott Morrison is very much on the nose wherever you look. His net approval rating in these electorates is negative 11 points. Secondly, it shows why. Voters rank climate change in these electorates. Voters rank climate change the number one voting issue in, um, in, a single, in, in the majority of these electorates. And integrity in politics is usually second. The incumbent MPs say that they support climate action as their constituents want, but they never vote for it when it really counts. Trent Zimmerman sat on the parliamentary committee that reviewed Zali's climate bill. He didn't even have the stomach to support it being debated in parliament, let alone vote for it. Voters are becoming increasingly aware that their representatives vote with the coal-loving climate science deniers like Barnaby Joyce every single time. They talk the talk, but voters know that they don't walk the walk. In response, we're seeing the greatest wave of independent campaigns in Australia's history. Kylie Tink in North Sydney, Allegra Spender in Wentworth, Zoe Daniel in Goldstein, Dr Monique Ryan in Kuyong, Dr Sophie Scomps in McKellar, Joe Dyer in Boothby, Kate Cheney in Curtin, David Pocock and Kim Rubenstein uh, here in the ACT Senate, Georgia Steele in Hughes, Hannah Beth Luke in Page, Kate Hook in Calair, and Nicolette Buller in Bradfield, just to name a few. These candidates don't need to go into politics to be successful because they are already successful. They're business owners, doctors, lawyers, journalists and athletes. They're in it for the right reasons. Polling shows us that many of them are moving into very competitive positions. Now, many people are having a hard time getting their heads around this community independence movement. They cannot see it through anything other than a party lens. The movement's nothing like a party. There's no hierarchy, there's no leader, there's no head office, there's no co coordinated policy platforms. Some have come up through the uh, voices of groups in more than 70 electorates. Cathy McGowan said recently that nobody really knows the true depth and breadth of the movement. It is growing quickly, bubbling both above and below the surface. Viable campaigns are popping up in many of these communities and it's estimated that there are currently 10,000 actively engaged volunteers. There's the great work of former press gallery journalist Margot Kingston with her No Fibs website that pops up at every election and her relentless commitment to covering campaigns from the grassroots up. This is a spontaneous, autonomous and entirely individual set of responses across the country to community dissatisfaction with politics as usual. Many of the campaigns informally swap notes on who has the best deals on t-shirt printing, how to run a good fundraising event or what a volunteer code of conduct might look like. For the campaigns, this information is open source, freely shared. If they don't know, they often ask Climate 200 or Kathy McGowan's Community Independence Project. And we put them in contact, in contact with the experts who know how to get through. The party machines are formidable beasts and they're set up to perform all the roles 
that candidates need. But just as technology and new business models have disrupted so many industries, including the media, of course, campaigning is changing. The community independents are disaggregating the services that are required to run a campaign. The community campaigns are organising using digital tools such as Zoom, Slack, Nation Builder and social media. They don't need a party structure. Over 400 people joined Kylie Tink's launch in North Sydney. How many Labor or Liberal Party electorate launches will attract as many enthusiastic supporters? If you don't have a party behind you, one of the toughest challenges is fundraising. And this is Climate 200's contribution to this complex tapestry of a social movement. Climate 200 levels the playing field so that community-backed independents can have a fighting chance against the party machines. We are now 8,000 donors and we're growing. Our donors chip in together to back candidates who share our common values. Our values are simple, not a policy platform, deliberately not specific. A science-based response to climate change. Ending corruption in politics. And real progress on gender equity and the safety of women. Climate 200 is not a party in any way. We don't start campaigns. We don't choose candidates. We don't dictate policies. We don't speak for any independent candidate. They speak for themselves. We simply give them a leg up with funding and support. It's as if each community, bear with me, it's as if each community is building a car. They're all different shapes and sizes. Some have similarities. They all have an engine. They all have four wheels. They all have seats. Most have a radio. Some of them have the same colour because, frankly, there aren't that many T-shirt colours left. <laughs> <laughs> what Climate 200 seeks to do is strap a turbo onto that car or a spare battery pack, if you will. If a campaign wants to work with us and we want to work with them, we can make their cars go faster. Now, look, together we'll never come close to matching what the major party funding machines can, are delivering. But together we've raised over $7 million. Last weekend we received our 10,000th donation from 8,000 members. Thank you. Thank you. From a very broad cross-section of Australian society. Now, this is, a similar, this is a significant sum, but it pales into insignificance compared to the major parties. Our donors come from all walks of life and from every single electorate. They're pensioners, retirees, teachers, nurses, doctors, tradies and farmers. A third of our donors are from rural and regional seats. Ben Jowett is one. He's a 55-year-old electrical fitter from a small rural town in New South Wales. He's a proud Navy veteran and he's a member of the local RFS. He's been donating $15 a month since we started because he wants climate action and he desperately wants a national anti-corruption commission. Now, me personally, I, I have contributed, as David said, I've con contributed about 2.5% of Climate 200's total funding so far. So to confuse Climate 200 with me or to mischaracterise this move movement as Eastern Suburbs Trust Fund kids, as a Liberal senator, Liberal senator recently claimed, is to totally misunderstand what's going on here. More than 800 Climate 200 donors responded to the senator, setting her straight on her tweet. Climate 200's thousands of donors are here to give this historic wave of independence the best shot at entering the fortress that is our federal parliament. All else remaining equal, if just what, three more pro-climate independents, pro-climate, pro-integrity, pro-gender uh, equity independents are elected, they would be able to hold the party machines accountable and deliver progress on these issues. But it won't be power without a purpose. As Ali Stegall calls it, it'll be the power of balance. With three months to go to the election, the independents are already having a massive impact.
For the first time in a long time, the Liberal government is having to fight for communities they've long taken for granted, communities that they have abandoned. Communities that deeply care about climate change, the rights of gay and trans kids, ABC funding and oil and gas rigs off Sydney's northern beaches. In many ways, the independents are already winning. Now, I mentioned a challenge to the major parties a little earlier. Here it is. There's a lot of noise at the moment around electoral donation disclosure. Climate 200 goes above and beyond the legal disclosure requirements, encouraging all our donors, large and small, to disclose their names on our website. We're pleased that thousands have, and our list is updated weekly, near real-time disclosure. This is something that neither major party comes close to doing. However, given that the Treasurer himself has been, knowingly, has been known to personally call donors listed on our website and monster them, some have chosen simply to stop at complying with their legal disclosure requirements, as is their right. Now, we have long advocated root and branch reform of electoral funding laws. Lower disclosure thresholds and real-time disclosure. But the major parties have repeatedly blocked attempts by independents, such as Andrew Wilkie and others, to legislate these reforms. So here's our challenge. If the major parties agree to reduce the disclosure limit to $1,000 and require real-time disclosure, we will rapidly congratulate them and immediately follow suit for all donations received from that point onwards. And we have already taken the first step with our voluntary disclosure. So let's see a real commitment to reform and let's see it in, implemented in time for this election. <clears throat> There's nothing so wrong with our parliament that we can't fix it with the right people. We bemoan the takeover of parliament by careerists who started in student politics, worked as staffers and have never had a real job. We often lament that accomplished Australians rarely step up and run for parliament. Well, here are the independents that you asked for. Here are the real Australians that you wanted. Like most Australians, these candidates are not warriors of the left or the right. They speak from the heart of their communities about the issues that really matter. To those in the press gallery, please enjoy the fact that these independents aren't media trained. Their instinct, their instinct is to give considered, honest answers, not regurgitate to someone else's talking points. <laughs> to the rest of Australia, please get behind these candidates. Back them. These new independents are working for change, not for their careers. For the next two months, let's spend a little less time hacking at the branches and let's strike at the root of our weakened democracy. Let's join this incredible new wave. Let yourself feel the sense of optimism for the first time in a long time. One of our supporters described it to me as feeling a feeling of active hope. So instead of sitting at home complaining about lying politicians or corrupted media, there's a job for everyone in the movement. Because politics is too important to be left to politicians. If you live in an electorate with a community independent and you're able, Volunteer your time to the campaign. Hang a campaign sign on your front fence or in your apartment window. Talk with your neighbours. If you don't already, donate to the candidates or climb at 200. But just don't sit this one out. We're so lucky to live in Australia to be here with so much potential and opportunity at our fingertips. So let's fix Australia. Let's fix our democracy by getting more ordinary, extraordinary honest, and honest people in there. More women more people with life experiences formed outside the halls of politics. We've lost a decade on climate action, on integrity, on gender equity. But this next election will be a chance for voters to press the reset button on Australians' broken politics. And change is within reach. We have at most 94 days to grab it. Thank you.
Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. The court. That was a very interesting speech, uh, warmly received by the room, I've got to say. And uh, we've um, we've got about a dozen questions, so um, we've got limited time to get through as many questions as possible. So I'll ask at the top for one question each, and hopefully we can move through all of those a uh, dozen or so journalists who want to ask you more. Because of my position here, I do get to ask the first one, so I'm going to go for it now. Um, I want to challenge you on the idea in your speech um, that you're not a political party. And I, I, I think a couple of things occur to me here. You've got a common policy platform that your candidates are adopting. I know from looking at the Australian Electoral Commission that your financial controller happens to be a fairly common name on financial disclosures from all the different candidates. So there's an element of uniform or even coordinated financial control across several candidates. Uh, in theory, you may be able to withdraw support from a candidate who doesn't conform to your views as we get closer to election day, which the major political parties sometimes have to do. So are you actually avoiding some of the obligations that come from disclosure by not structuring yourself as a political party and choosing this alternative model? Well, firstly, let me, let me say that there are no difference in disclosure obligations on Climate 200 as there are for the major, major parties. So I don't see any advantage in us uh, registering. But basically, in, in, in no way are we a party. As I've said before, we don't start campaigns, we don't select candidates. We wait for these campaigns to come up through the grassroots and demonstrate strong community support, demonstrate capable uh, campaign teams and demonstrate the ability to fundraise within their community. No, we don't have a policy platform. We have a set of values and we will only fund those who also have those values. We don't specify in any degree of specificity how those are to be uh, how they are to be achieved, just that we have the confidence that that member will enter Parliament and deliver on the things that they have told their communities uh, that they would deliver on. Um, as far as there are, there are, we've talked about the disaggregation of the services in um, you know, that we no longer need parties to run viable campaigns, as uh, as Kathy McGowan showed, as, as Ali Stegall uh, has shown, and, and, and many others. We don't need these things, but you do need service providers, and compliance is a very, very tough. Thing in Australia with the laws regularly changing uh, and it is, makes complete sense that campaigns will go to service providers to help them with their compliance and frankly there aren't that many of them. Um, but just as you know, people might use the same accountant, uh, you, know, you, you probably wouldn't be surprised that most of these campaigns um, are swapping notes on where do you buy your t-shirts, where do you buy your core flute signs. Um, uh, you know, I don't we, we would be pretending to be something that we are not if we register a party, and we don't have any. We don't have any candidates. We don't have any candidates. So, what kind of a party can operate without a single candidate? The uh, the next question. <laughs> the next question is from Jane Norman. Simon Holmes of Court, thank you for your address. Jane Norman from the ABC and also a director here at the club. Um, I've got a hypothetical for you, but one that you've no doubt already considered. So it's election night, we have a hung parliament and Climate 200 uh, uh, candidates are in the mix to help form a, a government with either major party. Given the amount of money that you have contributed to the campaigns, will you be having a say in this scenario in which major party candidates help form government with? Have you decided which major party you'd like to side with? Yep. And if not, what kind of criteria are you applying to, I guess, um, give consideration to this? Yep. So this, this goes to what I said before about the misconception, uh, or, or at least, I guess, the, the lens that so many can only see politics through the eyes of a party. These candidates are not working in cahoots. Uh, these candidates speak for themselves. They are truly independent and have, you know, we have, we have no influence in what they will do in the next, uh, you know, immediately following election, uh, nor do we seek to. For us, if we were to try to undermine independence, not only would none of them want anything to do with us, but we would, we would be living a lie, and I can't, I can't do that. We, you know, the candidates will make their own decisions. Uh, they will have a mandate from their communities. They're very clear to their communities what they are going to Canberra, uh, yeah, what they are standing for. And if they are elected, then the only thing I can, you know, I can guess that being accountable to their communities, they will take their mandate with them. 
The next question is from Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Just, hey, just following up from that question, given your key priorities are climate change, a National Integrity Commission and gender equality, which party is, do you think is uh, best to achieve those measures if elected in, the, in May? And given that you're helping these independents campaign for those three particular issues, isn't it disingenuous to say, well, you don't mind who actually governs Australia um, when your whole campaign is to achieve these, these issues and it does make a difference who wins the election and who governs if, these, if the issues that you're passionate about are actually achieved? So you, you're, you're saying that one side is good on these and the other side's bad on these? Well, uh, <laughs> well I'm asking which party is better on climate change, integrity and gender equality? Yeah. So my personal opinion doesn't matter here because I won't be any I won't be in Parliament and I won't be in any negotiation room. This is a decision for the independents. So and what, Climate what, 200 is as I've said as I've you know, I am not the leader of this movement. I am but one small part of a movement of 8,000 people who are helping to fund candidates in, um, to level the playing field against the party machines in about 20 seats around, around the country. So my personal opinion on this, yeah, I, I would hope that both parties will come to those negotiations with their best possible policies to deliver on what Australians and those electorates want. But given you've just talked about climate change, we've got one party has a, has a um, target of, uh, a formal target of 26 to 28%, 2030. Another has a formal target of 43%. Yeah. You're encouraging people to donate to you so you can support candidates who will take greater action on climate change. We're in a hung parliament on election night and you're saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter who the independents back on climate change to actually... No, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm saying that my opinion on this doesn't matter. I'm saying that the independents will form their own opinion on which party is able to deliver on the issues that, that they have a mandate for. So this is an absolutely a decision for each of them individually. Nothing to do with me. And just, uh, three, yep. just finally, on the, on the issues though, the three issues that, you've, that you're, go, you're campaigning on, do you think, are you more impressed with Anthony Albanese's view on those issues or Scott Morrison's? <laughs> I, I don't think we've seen the final policy platforms of, uh, of, of the major parties and, as I said, my opinion here doesn't matter because I have no influence whatsoever the way that the independents who may be in the privileged position uh, of balance of power, I have no influence over their vote on any issue and I wouldn't have it any other way. Before we go to the next question, I realised that some of you didn't like the previous question, although I thought it was a perfectly fair one. So we are the press club. It is the job of the journalist to ask and the I'm question, even if you don't like it. <laughs> and I'm ready for it. <laughs> and, and the next question is from Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News. I'm going to make Greg feel better and be even less popular than him. because <laughs> I'm going to ask about the $100,000 cheque. Uh, Zali Stegall effectively blamed the accountant, Damon, Damien Hodgkinson. Is he still a director at Climate 200? Uh, should he stay on in that role or will he stay on in that role? And what does it say about struggling to manage a $100,000 cheque when you're talking about disclosing $1,000 donations? Yeah, so I, I completely reject uh, the characterisation uh, of, of uh, failing to manage. Look, Zali, Zali fronted the media about this yesterday. Um, this is an issue that was identified more than a year ago and resolved to the complete satisfaction of the AEC. Um, so we know yeah. Senator Andrew Bragg's job, he has been assigned to keep a watchful eye on everything we do. And it's kind of nice to have a guardian angel because it means that we, <laughs> we dot every I and cross every T. Now, he's, he's made spurious claims to the AEC, which they have dismissed. Um, but as for Climate 200, we are scrupulous in our compliance with all of the regulations. We go above and beyond. As I said before, the vast majority of our donors are on our website. Go check it out today. Um, we've been proactively reaching out to the AEC. They're aware of how we operate, what we do. 
Um, they haven't flagged any issues yet, uh, but if they do, we will implement any changes uh, promptly. You know, we have really strong internal uh, processes that uh, would flag any donations that are worthy of further review. And look, frankly, if the coalition is really, uh, if really, if it really cares, if Andrew Bragg really cares about improving transparency, maybe he might take a look at the bill that Andrew Wilkie introduced to Parliament yesterday to lower the disclosure threshold and implement real-time donations. That would make a huge difference. And let me just quickly say, the Coalition received $65 million in undisclosed donations in 2019. $65 million without any name attached to it. And Josh Frydenberg's Kuyong 200? $2.8 million over the last five years, and you won't find a single name against every one of those cents. Now, if we reduce the disclosure limit to $1,000, we would soon see who is, do is donating here, and we strongly advocate for that. And Damien staying in the role? I have no problems at all with Damien staying in the role. He's an, he's an excellent controller. Next question is from Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review and director here at the uh, National Press Club. Um, I will stick with the donations issue for a moment and go to something in your speech where you, you lay out the challenge to the major parties to introduce um, donation to closure threshold to $1,000 and require real-time disclosure. You're saying obviously that needs a, a change in the law to require them. What stop could, could be done voluntarily. Well, what's stopping you from doing it voluntarily today? I did go to your website today. I saw the list of donors. Yep. Saw the names. Didn't impressive, see how. Impressive, right? Sorry. It's impressive, right? I can't think of any other uh, crew that is at the, you know, any major party. But I, I don't know like whether that. they've donated one dollar, a thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars until we go through the AEC process. Yep. What's stopping you from today? If, you, if you're talking about integrity in politics and you want to set the standard, you can set yeah. the standard today. So we've already taken the first step. But as I said before, this is a David and Goliath fight, right? And some campaigns have chosen... Each campaign is choosing their own disclosure. So I'm not, I'm not speaking for campaigns. I'm talking about us. This is a David and Goliath fight. And asking David to tie his hands behind his back and put his, his slingshot down while Goliath is standing there with a bazooka and heavy artillery. Sorry, we're, we're trying to get these candidates in and when they're on the crossbench, they will be able to implement integrity measures. But we're not going to have... Can you know, we're not going to tie, rather. We're not going to tie our own hands behind our back. We have taken that first step. We have done what no major political party has done and put the names on our website. And we would be very happy to do more when the, when the major parties come and match us. Thank you. Next question from Catherine Murphy. Hi, Simon. Catherine. Just going to your um, uh, the Climate 200's values, if I may, for a minute. Yep. Uh, as you've articulated one, it's a science-based approach to climate change. What does that mean? Uh, there's another value which is, uh, you know, uh, standing up for integrity and accountability. Now, at the moment, there are three models for an integrity commission currently in debate. One is Helen Haynes, another one is the government's, another one is the Labor Party's. So, uh, can we put some specifics around those values that are very clearly ar mm. articulated by your org organisation? And also, just flowing from that, now, you've said a number of times today that uh, you have not uh, uh, sought undertakings, specific undertakings from yep. candidates, uh, but surely if you have agreed to fund candidates to run in, uh, in various electorates, knowing that there, it is possibly a minority government situation at the end of this election, Surely Climate 200 has had discussions with these candidates about what those values mean in practice. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. So firstly, specifics. No, it is not up to us to have specifics on these. If we start de dictating specifics, then we can hardly say that these independents are independent. Um, on your question about uh, agreements or something with candidates, Tell you an interesting story. We start, when, when we first started talking to candidates, saying you know, candidates came to us, having conversations about uh, about supporting. Um, 
we said, how about we, how about we write out an independent charter, right? An independent charter that says, you're independent, we're independent. We agree that there should be science-based response to climate change, integrity, uh, um, ending corruption, and treatment and safety of women. Um, and no further. That's, you know, that, that's, that's as far as the relationship goes, and we'll, and we'll sign a document there. And fascinatingly, we, we, had, we had pushback from independents saying, no, we will never sign anything in exchange for money. It took us a while to think, wow, we were just trying to highlight integrity. Right? We were just trying to make sure it's crystal clear. But no, the yeah, multiple independents came to us and said, that's even that one string is too many. We must it must be no strings attached. So our relationship with the candidates is with it. You know, we make a donation. If they ask us, you know, they're, they're looking for advice on who they can talk to about X Y Z. We'll pass that on. But um, yeah, we don't have any agreement with the. Uh, we, we don't have any agreement at all with the candidates. They are strictly independent, and it, that is of critical importance to them and we thoroughly respect it because otherwise it wouldn't be an independence movement. We're just picking up, given Greg set the precedent, David. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're active in climate policy space, Simon. You have been for years. Yep. Uh, what's the answer to my question, which is what's a science-based approach to climate policy? What's the answer? Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure this is the forum for it because I don't need to signal um, to candidates, I mean, they, we have a climate change authority. They publish reports, and maybe a uh, uh, a future parliament might restore that institution back to being able to give frank and fearless advice. Um, but I, um, you yeah, know, I think Zali got it right with her bill, um, and I don't think I need to. Um, I don't think I need to opine any further than that. Next question is from uh, James Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes, Court, for your address. James Morrow, Daily Telegraph. Um, I was interested to hear you speak so much about the David versus Goliath fight that uh, you involved in here, particularly in regards to the way the rules uh, that you're calling for applying to the major parties are being followed by you. Um, but the thing is, I'm struck by the fact that we live in modern Australia and not the biblical desert of ancient times. And I want to ask about... Your AEC donations return on 1 February 2022 has donations that are just below the donations threshold from somebody who was also a big donor to Zali Stegel, um, and they were broken up uh, about $56,000 worth. I'm wondering, given that uh, you've got the same director there has filed that return for Zali Stegel, is there an issue when you talk about integrity if there seems to be a pattern developing of donations being split and shouldn't your organization and your candidates live up to the same standards that you would like to see observed by the major parties? So I don't, I don't quite follow. There's a $56,000 donation in our disclosure um, well, from, a, from, a, from a single donor. No, it's, 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 it's split up to just below the donation threshold. Now, it's in the return there, but the question but, is but why the, is it split? The, the donation is named, right? The donation is named. Yeah, the, the donation came over time. But if it is split, you know, it's under the, underneath these thresholds. It has been disclosed. But the question is, again, why is it that if you want the major parties to follow rules I, of donation yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the thresholds donation. And, so, and so on, why don't you simply follow the, the same rules that uh, you would like to see firstly, and firstly, not hide behind the David and, David, uh, David and Goliath no, it, analogy? First, firstly, the donation you're talking about is not split. It is not hidden. It is absolutely clearly disclo disclosed. Splitting that donation would have been if every one of them had been, under, you know, if, if it had been split into, I don't know, the, I mean, think about that Kuyong 200 example. Do you really think that uh, every one of those donations is small? No, you'll have a look at it and you'll find that it's a whole series of donations just below the limit. Well, in this case, every one of those donations that you see in that disclosure there has been named. But why not, if you want, uh, you know, these rules to apply to the major parties, why not apply them first to yourself? No, we do. We do apply. We have followed the rules absolutely. I don't, I don't understand where you're, where you're getting it, sir. I'm saying that if you, you look at our disclosure, saying, if you saying, look at our disclosure, you will see the donation and the name next to it. Sure. That's not 
donation splitting. I'm not sure. Tell, tell me what you think donation splitting is. Well, if you've got a donation that's been split up into a number of amounts that are underneath In, the in order but, to hide well, the donation, but, right? But, but hang on, This hang donation on, hang on. has not been hidden. That's fine, Mr. Holmes, but you're saying throughout your speech that essentially your organization isn't, you know, you've got names on your website. We don't know, as people have asked before, we don't know how much they've donated, and yet you would and if like... if they are above the disclosure limit, you will see that dollar but amount... But you would like that they... donation limit to change, and so, I mean, we can argue about this all day, but what do you say to that you're following a double standard to what you would like to see the parliament... I, I reject that characterisation. We are being absolutely transparent. Okay. If, you, okay. if you had the same kind of transparency on the $56 million from the uh, undisclosed donation from the Liberal Party or the $2.8 million from Frydenberg's um, Kuyong 200 group, um, you know, if they could match our, our, our uh, level of transparency, what a better what a better parliament we would be. But I completely reject your characterisation of us as engaging in any uh, underhanded uh, behaviour. Thank you very much. I counted uh, five or six questions there. I'll be <laughs> chastised later by Laura Tingle, the president of the club. <laughs> you get the next question is from Mark Kenny. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Simon, for your address. Uh, Mark Kenny from ANU and the Canberra Times. Um, just on this question that's come up a number of times now, this issue about uh, the, the, the rules that you apply to yourself and the rules as they apply to, uh, to the political parties, um, given that you're talking so much about the restoration of principles, it, it, it's still not completely clear to me why you cannot just simply go to full disclosure of donations right now. Now, I, I assume that what you're saying when you make the David and Goliath analogy that um, you would, you, you, what you're actually referring to there is that you would get less money as a result of that because there are some people who under those circumstances might choose not to donate. Now, aren't you already much higher in your donations takings than you had originally intended? And wouldn't it be worth it for this principal to actually take that haircut? Um, yeah. I'm going to take a very quick second one, and that is, <laughs> can you just address the question that the, the Liberal Party in particular puts out about the Climate 200 or the independent candidates, uh, the Voices For and so forth, that they seem to be only emerging in coalition held seats? Okay, so a couple of questions there. Um, there are a lot of Australians who want the right to uh, to donate um, and, and they uh, would like privacy. Now, we have a system that as soon as the donation threshold, as soon as you pass a donation threshold, you no longer have the right to that privacy. That limit used to be $1,000. Howard government increased it to $10,000, which created uh, a very large uh, class of donations um, uh, that become undisclosed. Now, why do people want privacy? Um, I know of three Climate 200 donors who have received phone calls from the Federal Treasurer when he's supposed to be helping get this country out of our COVID recession. Three of them have been monstered by the Treasurer. I know people who have, his political opponents who have received phone calls, or their, sorry, their superiors at work have received phone calls and asked for them to be fired. Right? We live in an Australia where people are terrified of being identified as an opponent of the government. It's known as, an, as a vindictive revenge, and vengeful government. So I respect someone who wants to give $5,000 and says that, it want, that they want it to be, uh, to be private. I would like it to be $1,000 so it's a level playing field. I don't believe that there should be one rule for us and one rule for the others. We have already taken the first step and I invite the parties to follow us on this disclosure journey. But on your second one, question, why are all these groups rising up in coalition held seats? And I think that's, that's a really, really interesting question. And, and, why, and people say, and why not in Labor seats? Well, these, to, to, to get a movement like this up and going in a community, I mean, it starts with three or four people at a coffee shop or a kitchen table, and they bring in three or four friends, and then pretty soon before you know it, there's 100, 200, 300 people. And it is hundreds of nights and weekends given up for these movements and people putting in their, their, not only their free time and their talent, but also their money into these movements. Um, no one's doing this because it's some fake movement. They're doing it because they have passion. And where does that passion come from? It comes from the fact that they have been abandoned. The Liberal Party has abandoned the centre 
of Australia. They, the seats, well, Kylie Tink, when she launched her campaign, she said, when, she's voted Liberal every election of her life. She said, when Scott Morrison said that climate policy would not be set in the wine bars and dinner parties of inner, inner cities, she said that she knew that they were talking about her. They were saying, Scott Morrison said to Kylie Tink directly, you don't matter, right? That's where the passion comes from for the hundreds of people in North Sydney. Look, if the Labor Party had been in control for the last nine years and had done nothing on these topics and in fact taken us backwards, then you would see these movements rising up in their seats. But you know what? Yeah, I would love it if someone would run an independence campaign up in the Hunter. Um, they need a new narrative there, one that the major parties aren't giving but I have no control over that. Um, but these movements are rising up where people are fed up with the current politics. You know, we, we see uh, in Kuyong a really strong ne negative satisfaction with the government and climate and integrity as the top two values. Um, they're not seeing it from the, from the federal government. So don't be surprised when you see some of the biggest organisation you've ever seen uh, in a campaign running in a seat that no one's tried to win for a very long time. Thank you, sir. We um, haven't quite got to all the questions that we'd like, so our final question will be from Pablo Vinales. Pablo Vinales, SBS World News. Thank you for your address. You mentioned the number of prominent women that you are backing at the upcoming election. And given what we've witnessed in the past 12 months, and you said the sentiment of women around the country, that white hot anger, do you see this election as perhaps the best chance to fix this problem? And if you aren't as successful as you'd like, what does that mean? Well, certainly the passion is there, right? The, the, last year, we had a string of disclosures of horrific behaviour, horrific treatment of, of, of women, um, not just in Parliament House, but it, uh, a lot of women were empowered to speak up and I think we can all understand that a lot of women have, would love to be standing up, but aren't quite there yet. Um, and I think that's a, it's a big part of the movement. Whenever I go and talk to the community groups or um, hop on an online Zoom with one of the voices of movements, I find it fascinating that, uh, that the, majority, the vast majority of people in this movement are, are women. And you, you know, the campaigns are run by women. And it, but I think that's not surprising for people who've been in community organising, right? If you, uh, if there's some event to organise in the local community, let's say tomorrow there was a, you, did, you, know, you heard a dignitary was coming to town, you had to organise something, put it together really quickly. Who would you call to organise that? Would you call Helen Haynes or would you call Barnaby Joyce? Right? <laughs> Barnaby, the, the, the beer would be warm, the band would turn up a week later, right? And he would stand up and say what a great event it was. And Helen, you wouldn't even know that she'd organised it, right? She'd just efficiently, confidently, competently put the thing together and wouldn't need any thanks and would all, it'd just work like clockwork. And I think people are seeing that um, and women are seeing that, that the political system has not been working for them. They see Zali Stegall, Rebecca Sharkey, Helen Haynes and Andrew Wilkie up there, but they see these strong women up there who are no nonsense. They're not mucking about. They're not, they're not trying to climb the greasy ladder. They're not being given yeah, I've, a couple of uh, female senators have been given a job just to dig dirt and, and push it on me, right? You won't get that from Helen and Zali. At the end of the day, they go back to their rooms and they read through the notes of the next day in Parliament. They're not down at the pub trying to work their way up the greasy pole of politics. This is really inspirational for women around the country and I think a lot of men as well. We can see the figure that they have cut in Parliament and we can think, just a little bit more of that, please. A little bit more and we can have a very different country. Thank you.